We are so excited that you could join us tonight and a very special welcome to those of you who are watching this program online as this is simultaneously live webcast on our YouTube channel. If you haven't, please like us and subscribe to the Korea Society on YouTube. And tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Peter Serpico. Born in Seoul and raised in Maryland, Peter Serpico's route to, route to Korean food came came long after making a name for himself in New York City restaurants, most notably the original Momofuku Noodle Bar in the East Village, Momofuku Sam Bar, and Momofuku Co. As director of culinary operations, Peter earned three stars from the New York Times, a James Beard Award, and two Michelin stars, among many other accolades. Earlier this year, Peter and restaurant partner Steven Starr launched K-Pod in Philadelphia, where he lives with his family. And of course, we are here to hear from him about his first cookbook, Learning Korean, Recipes for Home Cooking, which he wrote with Drew Laser and was just published last week. Joining him in this conversation is our old friend, um, our returning guest, Eric Kim, whom now we can call the New York Times bestselling author of Korean American Food That Tastes Like Home. A quick reminder to our viewers and our audience, you will have a chance to ask your questions to Peter later this evening. And if you're watching the live webcast, you can send your questions via email, artsandculture at koreasociety.org. And please join me in welcoming Peter and Eric. How are you feeling? Yeah, really good. Really good. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. Um, I just have to say, Peter, this this book is excellent. It's just really, really beautifully written. Um, everyone here, make sure you get a signed copy. You got the man right here. Um, I wanted to just ask you, as someone who's lived in New York, and now you live in Philly, what have you eaten here so far? Or did you just get here? Oh, we just got here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you we're, excited to eat? Uh, we're, uh, we're tonight after the, the, this event, we're going to go to Ernesto's, uh, which I'm really excited yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. My friend, Ryan Bartlow, we used to work together in 2006, maybe. And, uh, he's doing really amazing things in the Lower East Side. Yeah. We're really excited for it. Nice. Pete Wells loves that place. Oh, really? So can't okay. stop talking Beautiful. about it. Yeah. Um, and then this is a personal question, uh, that I wanted to ask you. What's your favorite place to, or is your favorite place, favorite place to go to for food in Philly? In Philly, uh, besides would, your restaurant, yeah. Besides, oh. <laughs> I like, uh, I really like a. Uh, there's like this diner. Uh, it's called Fitzwater Cafe. Uh, if you guys ever go, they're only open for uh, breakfast and lunch, and it's uh, the place I go with my daughter. Very simple food, pancakes, sandwiches, stuff like that. It's perfect. I think it embodies Philly as well. <laughs> And you've lived in many places in your life. Um, do you have a favorite food city? A favorite food city? Uh, I think right now I'd have to say it was Philly because uh, that's yeah. where I live. <laughs> Philly's delicious. Yes. Philly is, I'm, I'm only just now kind of just, you know, discovering it. I have a partner who lives there and I just find the food so fresh. And I don't know. I think there's something to be said for like the fact that, I don't know if you feel this way as a restaurateur, but like, Maybe because there's more space and more, it's like away from, you know, something like New York. I, I always feel like the food just feels more honest. Yeah, I feel like it's a, it's a smaller city yeah. and there's a, I think there's more opportunity if you want to have like a mom and pop shop style restaurant. Yeah, delicious. Yeah. Um, okay, let's, let's dive into this book. Um, my copy at home has like a bunch of hearts and stars and like underlines and stuff in pencil just in case I want to erase it. But I do that because um, I like to like close read good writing. And this book is so beautifully written. Um, and I think the one thing that really, there's a line in here. I use my phone to like type notes and stuff, so forgive me. But uh, there's a line. I've often felt stuck in a holding pattern between two worlds, a birthland I don't know and a homeland that didn't always seem to know me. Technically, I'm Korean American, but for the longer, for the longest time, neither half of that term felt like it fit me. And um, I just wanted to ask you, you know, 
What about the term Korean American felt like it didn't fit you? I'd love to know because I, I think this is just like a, a cool opportunity for both of us. I'm like selfishly like really excited to talk to you because I wrote a book called Korean American while you were writing a book called Learning Korean. And even though, you know, I, I, had, I grew up in Georgia with a Korean mom. You grew up um, as a Korean adoptee in Maryland. There are some, there are things about our books that feel very like, you know, similar. And that really like warmed my heart. I just wanted to know, I'm sure like, I think everyone wants to know. Yeah, what, tell, us, tell us about a little bit about, about the journey around that word Korean American. And especially the word Korean, like it's like, as it pertains to you and your identity as a, as a cook. Um, well, so the Korean American thing is tough. Uh, it's something I've had to deal with my entire life. Um, the Korean part of it, um, if I talk to anyone that's Korean, the first word when I tell them I'm Korean is, oh, do you speak Korean? And the answer uh, is a very strong no. And if you, if I'm like, uh, say in a, in a cab in New Orleans and I hop in the cab and the cab driver says, where are you from? And I say, I'm American. And they always say, where are you really from? And that's when the Korean comes out. Yeah. So not, it, it doesn't seem like either one is the right answer. Um, when you talk to a lot of people. Yeah. It's so um, frustrating. Yeah, it's a it's it's a little frustrating. I, honestly, I've uh, I feel like I've been able to deal with it better um, in my adult life. Yeah. The older I get, um, and like it just doesn't mean I, I understand where I understand why why it doesn't make sense in their mind. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> man, I, I think the title of this book, Learning Korean, it's so uh, it's so genius. I like I, I'm really. Quite, you know, so fond of this book because um, there is this thing about the language, like being, especially being a Korean American in America. I always felt growing up that there was this tension with other Koreans, like trying to. There was like the scarcity mindset. It was like who can be the most Korean. There was that kind of like competition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you felt this way with other Koreans um, in your community, but um, so when people pull out their Korean it feels very violent. It's like you're in an environment where people are speaking English and, um, and then suddenly, you know, someone starts like doing that. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you speak it or not. It feels like, um, like someone's like puffing their chest a little bit. Do you have any experiences like that? Absolutely. That's <laughs> why I'm a loner. Um, <laughs> I really, uh, yeah, every time I get, uh, I meet up with a, a bunch of Koreans, it's always like a Korean off everyone's having a Korean off and it's always, I always lose. So, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> the Korean off happens with Korean Americans. I find, but not really with Korean Koreans. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know many like Korean Koreans. I guess I don't either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think the really beautiful part about your book is man, your, your family is so much in it. Um, I mean, I can relate to that, but it's really, I love that you, you know, you talk about your wife and your daughter as, um, they're almost like, the impetus to get you towards um, some different understanding of yourself as a Korean is that would, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I mean, without without thinking about it, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, it kind of scares me a little bit, and it um, yeah. I don't really know how to explain it, and I'm just living it. Yeah, I feel like you explained it really well in here, um, <laughs> but in, in in here you're sort of like talking about um, food as the way that you're able to, you know kind of find your Korean self. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like how, how cooking this book helped you do that? Because, you know, what's really lovely is these are amazing recipes, but you kind of talk about how um, it's not like you necessarily grew up with these, right? Exactly. So, yeah, this is like um, the reason that the food part of it is so, uh, you know, forward in my life is because I've been a professional cook my entire adult life. This is like all I've done. Um, so this is the way, uh, this is the way, this is the part of me that feels the most comfortable is the cooking part. Um, everything else is, uh, very scary. Um, <laughs> I feel like that in like my life just because I'm, I was raised in a kitchen essentially. Um, so every, every other aspect of it is, is just very, I, I don't know. I've never experienced it before. Um, like the emotions, um, how to act. 
Uh, so it's all new to me and I'm, it scares me, but I'm, I'm enjoying it as well. Um, because we're kind of, I'm doing it with my family, with my daughter, with my wife and kind of deciding who I, I truly want to be in my life and what I want to pass down to my daughter. Oh man, it really is scary. No one like talks about that. Um, putting yourself out there in a book and especially one that's so personal. Um, can I ask you, you know, was it a deliberate kind of decision to make, make your first book, this one, make it like a Korean book, Korean cookbook? Um, it's like a question you get asked a lot when you're yeah. in this space, you know? Well, I mean, I, I feel like my other option would have been to probably make like a restaurant cookbook. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, for some reason it just didn't speak to me. Uh, I just don't think that anyone wanted to make the food at my restaurant ever. <laughs> <laughs> they want to or, eat it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and it's like, wasn't like there, there, it was just, it felt like empty to me. And, uh, I'm at an age in my life where anything I do, I want to, I want to do it because I want to do it. Amazing. Yeah. I like that. That's how we, we should all live. Right. Um, okay. Let's, let's step back a little bit and you know, talk about your career. Yeah. I, I was reading that you, you worked at a pizza place. Yeah, early on. Yeah, across from a horse farm. <laughs> yeah, and in typical Peter fashion, he became the ma an, an a manager there. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. uh, that was really sweet. Uh, such a good description. It's a, it's in the intro, just a description of who you were as a kid, because it really says a lot about who you are now. Like really accomplished, you know, chef, restaurateur. And I think um, one thing I really think is important is those early jobs teach you so much. And actually, my first like. I haven't worked in many restaurants, but except as like a busser and like, you know, but um, I did work at a pizza place in high school and I wanted to ask you, what's the most important thing you learned at that job? <laughs> um, if you remember. Yeah, no, not really. I do remember that I, I worked a lot. Um, we had like weird uh, 10 to 10 hours and uh, I think I was 15 or 16 at the time. So I like my dad would wake me up early and like, I would still have to do my chores. I would have to like cut the grass before oh. I went to work. Yeah. Of course, I didn't think that was fair, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah what about your siblings? Um, well, me and my brother were in charge of cutting the grass <laughs> okay. and other chores. Well, the, well yeah. when I tell my dad this story, he always thinks that I never did chores. And that is not, <laughs> and that's absolutely not the way it went. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that really resonated with me was the way you talk about your mentors. I think that's like a really special thing. We don't just come out of vacuums, right? Like as people, but also as creatives. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, I'm sure everyone else would too, but can you tell us about your time with David? What was that yeah. Like? Yeah. My time was, my time was great with David, David. Ching. Yeah. So <laughs> he's the uh, founder of, and uh, founder of Momofuku. Um, I'm sure maybe you guys have heard of him. I don't know. Um, yeah, me and Dave had a great relationship. He uh, was kind of like a big brother to me. Um, I had moved to New York when I was 19 years old. Uh, I didn't know anyone when I moved here. Uh, I worked at a, a bunch of places before, and then Momofuku was where I ended up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was just, we. I feel like we have a very similar personality. We had a similar personality. I think we've kind of both gone a little bit separate ways. Um, but we both have children now too. So I think that we're kind of finding our way back. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was great. I would never, I never regret anything about working at Momofuku. It's a great experience. Um, I remember that was one of my first New York bites. I went to probably Sambar. Yeah, it was on, at Sambar. I would get the, um, the, the, the the bow with the pork belly in it and it had a, a runny egg do you remember when he did this it was like only f i don't know if it, it was like there for very long but i remember that was like so new to me at the time just this anyway that was like a bite oh it might have been a special that might have been a christina tozzi special it probably when was. sambar was young yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah. wow wow yeah milk bar was across the street man those are the days um i i wanted to ask you okay so when I'm doing, when I'm like on book tour and like talking to people, everyone always wants to know what it was like writing the book. And 
it's kind of like one of my least favorite things to answer because it's kind of boring. It's like, I don't know, I spent a year like writing a book. Like, you know, it's like, it's kind of granular, but I do think people are interested in it. And I say this because I, I also want to know, like, you know, this is wild. Like you were writing this during the pandemic, right? Yeah. Can you tell us like what years you were writing and what was it like? And, you know, how involved uh, were your, was your family and how much manual labor did you ask of your daughter? <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Uh, so let's see. So I started the book uh, probably in 2019. So three years ago, three years from the publishing date. Um, it was supposed to be ready before that, uh, but I had to ask for an extension, which this is my first cookbook. So I, yeah, I have no <laughs> idea what's going on. I'm glad, to, I'm glad to know that you did too. <laughs> I heard from what I hear, that's like pretty, uh, standard. pretty standard, uh, for authors. Um, and then it just, I feel like just, I've never had this much freedom and like a timeline. Mm -hmm. So of course I did what I did in probably school where I put everything off to the last minute. Um, and then I had that <laughs> and then it, nothing was ready. Um, but it was the way that I went about it was it was whenever I felt motivated to do it, you know, I would write a little bit, I'd write down some notes, uh, I would work on some recipes. Um, sometimes I do three in a day okay. and uh, sometimes they would all be great. They would work out like the first time, very few times, but sometimes I would feel like I had nothing. Like I, I, I worked for on three recipes and I had absolutely nothing from it. Um, but the failure part of it, I'm used to because of the restaurant. Um, I'm sorry. What was the second question? Oh, I think my question was just like, tell us about what it was like the day to day, you know, working on the book, and also how much the joke was just your manual labor. Oh, manual. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so also, um, obviously, so two two years ago was the when the pandemic started, and obviously, no one really saw that coming, um, and anyone that did didn't probably think it was going to be so long. Um, so we had to do all of the, uh, all of like the heavy lifting during the height of the coronavirus. Um, so yeah, we just, we didn't rent a space. All of everyone came to my house. Oh, yeah, so all the books, great. all the photo shoot stuff is, um, from my actual house where we, where we live. I love that though. I love that though. Um, it just felt really, I mean, so freaking cute. Look at that. Um, I just appreciated how I felt like I was just stepping into your house, you know? Um, and, you know, I do want to get into kind of a thesis statement that I've noticed in the book, which is it's through cooking the food that you are learning Korean. That's kind of like um, sort of a theme. Can I, Can you just share for us, like, what was your journey towards Korean food? You know, like... Do you remember your first bite of Korean food, um, like early on? How did you arrive at, you know, I'm gonna write a book of Korean recipes. Um, Especially as a chef of, you know, your renown and like your history, it's like, and you talk about momofuku being like one of those like early moments when you're, you know, kind of touching Korean food or Asian food. I'd love to know more. Yeah. Uh... I don't, it, nothing was really planned out. Um, I did want a family. I've always wanted a family long-term. Uh, I never thought like, hey, I need to be in Philadelphia. Uh, all the things just kind of happened organically. Um, my daughter is like the biggest inspiration for the book and for me wanting to learn Korean. Um, when it comes to the cooking part of it, we do a lot of cooking together. Um, my wife's family has been huge. So my in-laws have been like yeah. a, a massive part of me wanting to, to learn more about Korean cooking and to become a better cook. Yeah. Um, yeah, my wife, my wife makes excellent Korean food. She's a way better Korean cook than I am. Um, so yeah, just like, uh, and I'm also deep down, I'm like pretty competitive. So I'm hoping that maybe one day I could be a better Korean cook than her. <laughs> um, and if I work really hard at it for the next 20 years, I think maybe it could happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like how you say that Korean cook. It's, it's something that I feel like on, I've only started calling myself recently. Um, I mean, even after writing a Korean cookbook, like both of us, we wrote Korean cookbooks. Um, would you call yourself a Korean cook right now? Uh, 
Oh, that's a really tough question. That's a tough question, right? <laughs> I think so too. No, I'm always learning. Um, yes. I'm always, but I'm always learning from my professional career. Um, I just, I'm a cook. I'm like a cook. Uh, I've always been a cook. I'm probably always going to be a cook. And uh, yeah, I don't know if the Korean part necessarily need. I, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I, I can't explain it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I feel like it's also, um, you know, like saying that you are cooking in Korean versus just cooking. It's sort of like this step. And I don't know if like it's necessary to like call it out, but I've recently started feeling feeling it like when I come home and I rush to make like a tenjan jjigae and I'm like, oh, wow, that was like a really Korean thing to do. And it's like not something that I grew up doing. Like I would come home and make an omelet or something. I don't know. Because um, my mom was the one who cooked the Korean food. Anyway, um, I want to know, let's talk about the recipes a little bit. Because mm-hmm. I feel like it's in the recipes where you, we get to see um, all the really cool things you do. I also think that you're being humble. Um, like you've like developed all these recipes that are so delicious. And I mean, I wanted to ask you, um, okay, this is like a question I like to ask. It's kind of like, it's, I, it, it might be like, seem a little silly, but bear with me. Okay. So you wrote a whole book of recipes. Let's say this is like your album, you know, you're like a musician, you put out an album. What's like the lead single that you're going to put into the ether before the album comes out? Um, oh, that's, uh, like your, you know, yeah, I think it would probably be the countertop kimchi. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, that recipe was basically developed because, uh, I do, I make a lot of kimchi at home. I've been making it with my daughter, uh, especially since the pandemic. Um, our recipes got a little bit less spice and a little less ginger in it. Um, and that's why I kind of want everyone to see this as a cooking book and not a cookbook. Um, I actually want people to, uh, use the recipes in the book as a base and then kind of change it to their family's uh, palates. Um, so uh, because the book is, uh, I've been working on it for three years, the countertop kimchi was one of the earlier recipes. And it was, um, I forget where I forget where I was going with this. I have a smell. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a recipe that like, once I started making kimchi and learning more about it, it was the overnight brine that part I wanted to cut out of it. Right. So basically you just mix everything together. You put it in a Ziploc bag, you roll it up and you leave it out on the counter for two days. And then you don't have to do the second part of it. Um, yeah. Yes. You hear that. That's like genius. I mean, it's right here. Um, I was so fascinated by that, by that technique. I'd never seen that before. Um, what made you, how did you decide on the Ziploc bag? Um, Resealable well, plastic bag, we would say. Yeah. So the <laughs> Ziploc bag is just so it, um, you can kind of burp the air out of it right. and it can also expand if it needs to. Wow. Genius. It's almost like acting like, um, like a sous vide bag or bag or something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, uh, another recipe that really caught my eye was the, the Kamjatang. It's, um, you've titled it the spicy pork rib stew. And I want to ask, you know, how did you arrive at doing ribs? Because, you know, I think simultaneously in Atlanta, you were developing this in Philadelphia. Um, simultaneously in Atlanta, I was developing a kamjatang. And I was like, what if we did it with spare ribs? We did spare ribs um, and you did baby back ribs. Oh, nice. So I just love that, we, you know. I was like, um, I have a mind of, of a chef. Just kidding. I, um, I, I feel very, I felt very um, strongly personally about using ribs because those neck bones are kind of hard to find. But also, I love stewed ribs, and no one talks about that. Can you tell us about this recipe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was the exact same reason. Huh. Uh, because you can't really get pork necks in, like, American uh, uh, grocery stores. So part of the blueprint of the book is uh, we wanted to have a very small amount of ingredients, but also ingredients that were accessible. You're supposed to go to like your H Mart, your Asian market, get all of your pantry ingredients with which mostly are not perishable and then kind of fill in the blanks with, uh, you know, your Wegmans, Whole Foods and things like that. And like Wegmans, Whole Foods, we have a Sprouts by us. They don't have pork neck. Right. right. And if you ask them for it, they just look at you and usually they just walk away (laughs) like you're (laughs) like you're joking or something. (laughs) For my for my book shoot, I went there to try to get those really long kalbis. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to do kalbi tang, but with like the really long handlebar kind of like bone. And 
they just like didn't understand what I was talking about. I was like, T- you know, take that piece of meat you see there and just like. <laughs> anyway, um, it's funny that you guys also live next to a Sprouts because like that's where I got a lot of my groceries for my book development. Oh, nice. <laughs> just saying, this is like a this is um long overdue meeting. I think. Um, Okay, uh, we talked about what you, your single would be, which is the countertop kimchi, which everyone has to try tonight. Um, there's, like, no excuse not to. It's, like, so... It looks so easy. And also, one thing I really... Wait, let's talk about that kimchi a little bit, though. Do you think making kimchi is easy or hard? If someone were to walk up to you, some Joe Blow... I think it's... I think it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I think making kimchi is impossible. Because every day, every time you make it... <laughs> It's a little bit different because the ingredients are different. And uh, it, yeah, it's about every day. It, it tastes different. So that's why I think you're better off just making a larger batch and just kind of eating from it. Because if you make it really good, it's just it just gets better and better over time. And if you make it really bad, you can kind of just like throw it in some like stews or soups and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love that honesty because I've definitely had moments where I'm in front of a camera and I'm like, kimchi is not that hard. It's like, uh, it's really not that hard. Like it's pretty easy, but when I do it, a part of me feels like I'm lying a little bit because it's <laughs> it's not for me. It's not that I, I think it's hard. It's that it's um you have to be open to the variability. And yes. I think a lot mm-hmm. of people maybe aren't people who are used to following recipes and um you know okay I, I like what you said about the grocery store thing and like accessibility of ingredients. How did you decide? Were there any ingredients that you decided to take out because they were like they didn't fit that bill for you? Um, and what yeah, were they? Yeah, uh, we tried to not use so much fish, uh, just because I think that fish is really tough yeah. to get like high quality fish. Yeah. Um, when we go to the most grocery stores, we don't buy any fish. I'll just reach out to like um, the people that we use through the restaurant yeah. to get like higher quality stuff. Um, so yeah, we try to stay away from uh, a lot of, a lot of the fish product yeah. and stick with meat and vegetables. Cause grocery store fish is so bad usually. It's really, yeah. Also <laughs> like previously frozen too. That's why I prefer to get fish. Um, if, especially for a crane food, certain dishes, like just get them at H Mart in the freezer aisle. Cause like they're already frozen. It's like, they're also more esoteric cuts. Anyway, something I'm trying to get people familiar with, you know, these other markets. Mm-hmm. So, like that's like kind of a hard thing to do as well. You know, when you were developing this book and thinking about ingredients, it's something I think about all the time, but were you kind of thinking in people's shoes as you were grocery shopping, like in Philly, were you thinking, if I can't even find this, like I won't call for it? That's how I decided on Morton Coarse Kosher Salt. Oh, okay. We went, yeah, we went with Diamond Crystal. Yeah, it was just fine. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> like that. Oh, but that's the biggest thing with the uh, all the kimchi is that what I found out is all salts have different salinity levels. Oh yeah. For sure. So when it comes to like recipes like kimchi, that the salt is helped is used to help, uh, you know, with the bacteria, the bad bacteria, but you have to be careful because every salt is different. Man, it really is. It really yeah. is. Um, well, speaking of salt, I think salt's like the main ingredient for fermentation, but would you say, or maybe someone would say it's like air or something, but, um, What's like one tip that you would give someone who's fermenting for the first time? Um, just be trying care- to get people to make be, it kimchi. Be careful, yeah. Just be careful. Um, if it molds at all, don't eat it. If it it shouldn't mold at all if it's per- fermented properly. If it molds, it means it went bad, and probably you didn't add enough salt, or there's a, a yeah, or there's a foreign like substance in there, like from your hands, your cutting board, or your knife. Yeah. My mom always kind of taught me that it's really just as long as you you just need enough salt, and also in the sauce as well. It's like the sauce should be pretty like salty. But um, you know, I was talking to um another Korean recipe developer last night actually, and she was saying that if you have too much salt, then it delays the fermentation. I thought that was interesting. Hmm. But I feel like that's better than it going bad. Yeah, and that's why that's why so, I feel like kimchi is impossible. It is. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Uh, though lately I've been playing with some pet kimchi, which is like the white one. Mm-hmm. So it seems a little more doable for some reason because it's like, anyway, um, I don't know why. The only difference is that it doesn't have the chili flakes, but uh, it's kind of the same thing. Um, okay, before we go to uh, your questions, I like to do like 
a lightning round. Does that sound fun? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Does that make you nervous? Yeah. Well, it, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, I'm like, I haven't even written them down, but I have like my questions that I want to ask you. Um, okay, the first question is kimchi jjigae or tenjan jjigae? Kimchi jjigae. Yeah. In my talk, I was asked that, and I said tenjan jjigae, and everyone gasped. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, vanilla or chocolate? Chocolate. Soju or sake? Sake. Sake. I know, me too. Me too. Yeah. Even my dad likes hot sake. Um, it's not like you can really do like hot soju, you know? I mean, maybe some people do, but. Maybe room temperature, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Salmon or tuna? Uh, well, salmon. Okay. Um, kamja tang or solang tang? Kamja tang. Oh, so good. Perilla or fresh mint? I'll go fresh mint. Yeah, fresh mint's really good. Um, okay. Uh, chapche or spaghetti bolognese? Sorry, I Ch- feel like that. Chapche. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I think I would have. Although, yeah, I, yeah I, my, I grew up with spaghetti bolognese, though. Oh, yum, yum. Yeah. Um, man, that's a hard one. Okay. I'm glad I don't have to answer it. Um, okay. I think. <laughs> Should we go to uh, audience questions? If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a mic. But I have a question from one of the viewers online. Mm, Um, Jeffrey asks, so much of Korean food in America seems focused on barbecued meats like kalbi or bulgogi. To what extent does your book broaden horizons in Korean food in America? I'm sorry, what was the last... What was the last to thing? what extent does your book broaden horizons in Korean food in America? Oh, okay. Um, I think that like a lot of the book, uh, it was like a hundred recipes. Uh, so a lot of the things are vegetable focused and things that are accessible. Um, so when it comes to like bulgogi or galbi, like there's only so many recipes you can have for those. That's so that's like four recipes out of a hundred. Um, <laughs> so yeah, a, a lot of our stuff is, um, it's, it's uh, uh, like stews, soups, rice dishes, and then mostly you can just basically make your own meal out of all the panchan and things like that. So it's, um, I, I think you can kind of cater it to whatever meal you're trying to serve, whether it's a quick meal at the office or like you're trying to blow it out for your family. Um, it's very, yeah, Korean food is very versatile. Hi, Chef. Uh, my name <laughs> is Jay doing, Lee. Um, so as we were developing this cookbook, um, how connected did you feel to your blood, to your culture? Um, did you feel, were there anything that stood out to you or something that maybe you've never thought of? Um, well, that's the part about it, I'm, it being like a little bit scary and it like not, I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm getting into. The blood part of it's really uh, uh, an odd focus for me because I feel like my bloodline has just started with my daughter. She's the only person that I've ever met that has my blood. Um, So uh, to me, it's like very powerful. And uh, I didn't feel that same way about the, my, my bloodline to Korea. Hello. Um, I grew up in New York City, uh, so I'm like I'm prefacing it with that. And to, but um, it wasn't till around the pandemic, or after the pandemic, that I tried like Korean food for the first time because after watching K dramas, so I was like, oh, what are they eating? <laughs> I want to try. It. I'm like, that's, that's basically how it happened. I'm like, I want to try that. So I went down to um, 32nd Street, and it's like you know because Korean Town is only one block, and I was like, the first time I tried it, I was like, oh, this is really good. But to me, it's like. It's kind of a shame because I'm like, it's in my own city, but I didn't even know it was there until I went to go look for it. My question is like prefacing because it's like, if you go to like any, um, like a lot of areas, you can find Japanese food, you can find Chinese food, you can find Thai food, but like you really don't really hear anything about Korean food. So I'm just trying to figure out how, um, and I'm, I think more people should try, but I'm like, what do you think could be done to like make it more accessible to more people? 
Um, I think it's kind of what we're trying to do at my restaurant in Philly, which is called K-Pod. Um, where it's like, I don't want to say it's, it's definitely not authentic food. Uh, we kind of, we kind of market it as Korean American. Um, and I think I personally have like a really good advantage when it comes to that because I didn't grow up with Korean food and I don't have a Korean palate, uh, because of that. So, uh, I understand why I like some certain Korean foods now that I'm older and I, I, I don't know. I think that like. Korean food is very versatile, and even the stuff that you see in the restaurants now doesn't usually speak to all of Korean food. It usually just speaks to like the uh, the um, you know the the songs, right? Your your hit song where it's like Kalbi, you know, uh, Bibimbap, Kimchi Pancake, that kind of stuff. But there's like a lot more to Korean food, and uh, I don't I don't know. I mean, unfortunately, I feel like the bigger picture is, is that it's a business. So any restaurants have to be businesses. So you have to cater to whatever brings in business. Um, so I, I think that's why you see a lot of like the, you know, we uh, Korean, the, 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 it's like a Korean restaurant that also does like sushi, you know, and they'll do like pretty much anything, anything that might be Asian. And they try and like put it all together and uh, usually don't do anything really, really well. And can you I, can, can certainly I respond to watch that Korean, oh, yeah, the yeah. Korea Society programs to learn more about Korean food. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming, everyone. Um, but I wanted to respond to that if, if I can. Um, there's a reason why there are so many Korean-owned Japanese restaurants, especially in, in Atlanta. Um, I took that for granted growing up. I was just like, yeah, that makes sense. That Korean guy's making us sushi. <laughs> it's like, but it's a Korean restaurant. They, they serve like hobakjuk and aibap and stuff like that. But um. You're right, it does have to do with the business side of things, but one thing that um, I, I did want to ask you is, you know, if kimchi is like that main, you know, that, that song, it's like that thing that everyone knows, what's the, what's kind of like the track 11, you know, recipe that you really adore, um, and that if someone came to your restaurant and ordered it, and you'd be like, whoa, thanks for ordering that. What? <laughs> Sorry, that's a weird, weird, weirdly phrased question. But what would that dish? What would that Korean dish be for you? Um, the chef Esther Choi, who runs Mok Bar, um, she sometimes serves this konguksu. Do you guys know konguksu? It's pretty esoteric, like you know, soybean um, cold noodle dish, and kind of, frankly, kind of bland. Um, but it, she loves it. It's like it's like it speaks to her soul, and it's her like track eleven kind of the ballad that no one that like only hardcore fans like listen to but so when the six people order that every week she makes it for them i just thought that was so lovely anyway um what is that for you whether in this book or just in general um in the book uh let's see i probably have to say it's like the uh yogurt drink oh, yeah That's there's a uh, yeah so i so when we when I, when Charlie was younger, when my daughter was younger, we used to she used to love the like the little Korean yogurt drinks and uh, they're delicious. But then when you like read the label, it's just like corn syrup and it's just horrible. So we tried to make it without any of that stuff. Um, so that's but it's it still it still hits all the notes. It's like salt. It's like sweet. It's like um, it's cold. It's got that like that viscous feel of like a almost like a milkshake, but it's like pretty healthy. It's genius. It's so yeah. genius. And you know, the thing about those little bottles is that it's never freaking enough. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's like, come on. Um my parents have just rows and rows and rows of it. Um like they drink it still. It's just because I think it's probably nostalgic for them. But um anyway, this is genius so that you could have a lot of like a really good thing. That's something that I really like doing as an adult. Anyway. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, you mentioned uh, earlier in the conversation uh, you steered clear from, I guess, fish because of its availability in supermarkets. Is there a Korean fish recipe that you recommend? Um, I don't know what it's called. I just like it when it's like uh, like battered. Uh, my mother-in-law does it where she'll just take like a white flesh fish. Um, it's kind of like the zucchini. I think you could do it with the the zucchini recipe. Uh, you just dust it in a little bit of, you cut it into like little medallions. You dust it in like a little bit of flour, and then you put it in your uh, an egg, just whipped egg, and then you just griddle it in a little bit of oil. Um, 
Chan. That's really good. Oh, okay. That's okay. I love that because it's like fleshy white um, and no bones. No bones, yeah. And somebody asked, um, what was the biggest adjust adjustment for you to try cooking at home as a professional chef? Um, I'm still learning how to cook at home. Um, and this is a lot of the learning process happened with the book because you don't realize you have to do the shopping. You got to come, you got to walk everything back. I always carry, try to carry way too many groceries. Um, <laughs> I always make at home though. Um, and then you got to put away the groceries, you got to make the food and then you have to clean up afterwards. So all with all those steps, I feel like you have to learn how to almost like, uh, organize your time more responsibly. Um, so like sometimes if I just need to go pick up a couple of things, I'll put like a little pot of water on and I'll put it on medium. So I'll have like a, a pot of water ready to go when I get home. So I, I have a plan usually. Um, and that's a lot of the recipes in the book are, um, like the stews and things like with the pork rib stew, you like start with the pork ribs and then you add your potatoes. But like, once you get better at it, you, start with your pork ribs and then you while you're cutting your potatoes. So if you're a beginner cook, I would recommend doing all the things you need to do before you start cooking. But when you become a little bit more advanced, uh, you can kind of um, cut down your time, your prep time. Um, next question I have is, what was the easiest recipe? Well, the recipe that really shockingly surprised you because, because you just nailed it in one go. And what was the hardest recipe that you've worked on in the book? Um, the easiest recipe uh, was, is the no cook uh, chili crunch. I think it's called, uh, might be potato chip chili crunch in there. So instead of, I, I made like the chili crunch, which is like trending right now, which everyone loves. Um, and most, uh, the technique is usually you pour hot oil over your chilies and that's what gives it the crispy. Um, but the first time I made it, you, I was browning my onions. I was frying my onions slow and I got cocky and I turned it up and I burnt them. So then I was like, oh, what am I going to do? Uh, so that's when I, uh, decided to just get that crunch from potato chips that were just crushed up. So potato chips that are crushed up, a little bit of oil, the recipe in here is pretty light in, um, uh, in, in heat because of my daughter, but like, it's so easy to just add some more things to it. Some more, uh, like Calabrian chilies or whatever, chili flake, cochucado, you can add more of, um, the hardest recipe, uh, same thing with at the restaurant. It's the mandu. <laughs> I, I just, it's like the texture of it. Uh, sometimes it's like too juicy. Um, that one, I think I had to work on probably like six or seven times. And then when my recipe tester reached back out to me about it, I wanted to change it. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that professional chefs find mandu really hard to make. <laughs> oh, my God. So here's a question from Ari. Um, hi, thank you for your book. And thank you to Eric for being such a kind, considerate interviewer. As a fellow Korean adoptee, I constantly experience, quote, imposter syndrome, end quote. Have you experienced this, and how did that af affect writing this book? Um, yes, I have experienced it. Uh, I do experience it every day. Um, but I just felt like I have to, I just have to do it. And, like, whether it makes me uncomfortable or not, whether I feel like I'm connecting with other people um, I just, I have to, I, for some reason, I feel like I have to do this for me and I have to do it for my daughter. Um, it just feels right. Uh, I understand that I'm still learning about Korean food. I'll always be learning about food my entire life. Um, so I think that's what makes it a little bit, uh, easier. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, yeah, I do have to deal with the imposter syndrome all the time. I think we have time for one Me too. question, Just if you do have one. Or, Eric, do you want to finish it off? Uh, any more questions? Well, I mean, I just selfishly want to know, what's your next book? And also, <laughs> um, you know, like, 
What are what's something you're really looking forward to learning after learning Korean? Um, I want to start. Uh, I w- kind of want to start learning how to make uh, temple food, <sighs> vegetarian, oh. vegan food. Yeah. Um, I don't know how far I want to dive into it. But I, it's definitely piqued my interest with all the techniques and things like that. And I would almost like to go backwards where it's like, you know, we're not using like modern, you know, I'm not going to use like a dehydrator. I want to just use like the sun. Um, and we'll see. Yes. Yeah. Please write that or open that restaurant. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so there's so much to learn from temple food and especially as everyone kind of works more towards like a plant plant based diet, you know, it's like. Um, and I, I just, that's, those are like some of my favorite meals, just going to the mountains in Korea and like having one of those like panchan spreads and then just get to eat it. Anyway, I hope you do that. Well, thank you so much, Peter and Eric for joining us tonight. And thanks for sharing your stories. Um, we have the learning um, Korean as well as Korean American available for sale. So if you like, you can get a copy and get get it autographed by the two. And we have some um, drinks and snacks available as well. But thank you so much for joining us. But thank you, Peter. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. Thank you.